So a couple of you asked me to comment on this channel, Fit Shorty Eats, particularly this recent video called Why Our Baby Will Only Eat Fruit. Uh, the people who run the channel, it's Tina and Simon. They're a couple and they are like uh, fruit hunters, I guess. They live, I, I think, primarily in Southeast Asia, just kind of traveling around a lot and looking for rare fruit, like rare uh, types of durian and whatnot. And they are fruitarian, so they eat only fruit, which is not actually true. I don't know why I'm nitpicking this because it, it's not an important part of any of this, but I mean, they do eat coconut or they drink coconut water and I'm pretty sure coconut isn't a fruit, but whatever. It doesn't, you know, it, the diet is bad. It doesn't matter whether or not they're eating technically, you know, fruit or not. So obviously, uh, Tina got pregnant and they're going to have a baby. Um, this is actually from a month ago. They've already had the baby. They have a bunch of pictures, uh, and updates on Instagram. So little boy, baby Leo. I wasn't going to talk about this because if you go on YouTube and look at the comments, like almost every single comment, this is just, this is bad. <laughs> this is bad. This is child abuse. So it seemed like pretty much everybody knows this is a horrible thing. Don't, don't do this thing, you know, but then you go to their Instagram and they have, you know, way more people engaging with their stuff and it is overwhelmingly positive. In fact, I think the only negative comments I saw on like recent posts was after I posted about this video on uh, YouTube on like the little community page or whatever. After that, I went to one of their recent posts and I saw some like really recent comments that were like, hey, this isn't good. You should see a dietitian. So I'm, I'm pretty sure those people were coming from, from my post, you know, like reasonable people. But yeah, it's clear they have a huge following who thinks they're doing a good thing by only eating fruit and who might also be influenced by this and might want to get pregnant and think that, yeah, that's an appropriate diet to consume while pregnant. And yeah, once my baby is old enough, it's totally appropriate for them to just eat fruit. So I have some thoughts. I want to comment on some of the things in the video. I don't think any other parents around the world get asked that question. I mean, can you imagine going up to a pregnant mom and asking her like, are you guys gonna feed your child what you normally eat like even if we have a family who is like at mcdonald's one day kfc the next day and pizza hut the next day nobody really even bats an eyelash like that you know they're gonna feed the same to their child but we get asked that all the time so this is something that a fair number of vegans say whenever someone questions a vegan diet, particularly a vegan diet for children. You know, it's like, well, what about other people? Why don't you criticize when they're feeding a kid bacon? That kind of stuff. That vegan couple did it in a, a really sensitive video that I responded to a while back. And it's, it's pretty disgusting. If you really think that feeding processed foods, junk food, animal products to a kid is not only, not equivalent, but worse than feeding a diet to a child, like a fruit diet that is so inappropriate that it can kill them, that it can kill them before they even reach like the age of one. If you really think that the former is worse than the latter, I don't, you are so far gone. I don't, I don't even know what to say. So yeah, that's pretty much how the video starts. It's about, about two minutes in. So it gives you uh, a pretty good idea of where these people are coming from. So anyway, she goes on to say, of course, you know, you saw in the title that they will feed their kid fruit because of course they're going to feed their kid whatever they eat, just like any other parent. And it's like, well, yeah, but most people don't, don't eat only fruit. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different, a different situation, obviously. You know, hard to estimate how much breast milk I have. Looking by the size of my boobs, which have like tripled in size since I got pregnant, I think there's going to be plenty, I hope there's going to be plenty of breast milk. And I really hope to feed our, breastfeed our child for a really long time. And by really long time, I mean until uh, he, he weans off naturally, which could be four to six years. Obviously, breast milk is much more appropriate. <laughs> there are only two things that are appropriate for babies a year and younger, and that's breast milk or formula. However, breast milk is not perfect. Uh, it is low in iron, which is fine for the first like four to six months. But after that, it's recommended to give them some sort of supplement. So I, either just like a liquid iron supplement or some iron fortified cereal. Considering that Tina and Simon think it's okay to only eat fruit, that that's a healthy diet. I would be surprised if they even know about this. And even if they do know about it, 
they probably think that it's not true and that it's fine as long as you eat fruit, you'll get enough iron. I mean, we're talking about people who don't brush their teeth. The fiber with which the fruit comes with cleans out your teeth, so there's no need no need to brush your teeth. And even if the baby, baby Leo, even if he is eating some solids, like at six months, uh, again, it's, it's just going to be fruit, apparently, which is not really a good source of iron. Vitamin D is another potential nutrient that could be concerning. Uh, young babies, like younger than six months, have really uh, thin, sensitive skin, so it's recommended to actually keep them out of the sun. Um, instead, it's recommended to give them vitamin D drops because breast milk tends to be low in vitamin D. Now, obviously, Tina gets a lot of sun, so her breast milk may actually be sufficient just because of how much sunshine she gets. Do you know we are meant to get no less than seven hours of tropical sunshine per day for our brains to fire on all cylinders? <laughs> how much do you want to bet that she thinks sunscreen causes cancer? Anyway, iodine is another one, obviously incredibly important for uh, development. There's a reason that there was a huge push in like the was it the 30s or 40s in the US to uh, to get iodine into babies? And that's why we have iodized salt. This could be another nutrient that is low in her milk. Um, and really everyone should ensure that they have a source of iodine in their diet, especially pregnant women. And relying on fruit is a really dangerous idea because the amount of iodine varies wildly. Most fruit typically not going to be a good source of iodine, uh, but it also, you know, amount varies wildly just depending on soil. So clearly the most obvious nutrient of concern would be vitamin B12. Now she does say in this video that at the end of the first trimester, she had really, really low energy. Like she almost blacked out. They were doing some sort of hike or something. And so she went to get her blood checked, uh, her B12 levels checked, which apparently she does every single year because she has some sort of uh, genetic disorder, something that runs in the family that causes B12 deficiency. So she tends to get this every single year. And apparently she didn't have time to get it done before they started trying to conceive, before she got pregnant. So anyway, she gets the blood work done and her B12 levels are incredibly low according to her. And so she starts supplementing. And then she says in text that after she started supplementing for B12, her energy came back. So obviously, number one, every single vegan needs to supplement for B12, fruitarian or not. Number two, having a genetic propensity for B12 deficiency and not just automatically supplementing for B12 makes this even more insane. And number three, trying to conceive before she was able to verify that she wasn't B12 deficient. That is so, so negligent and unfortunately not surprising. You know, there are a lot of raw foodists, like even in like leaders, right? Leaders in the raw food movement or former leaders, uh, like Doug Graham of the 801010 diet who believe that eh, B12 isn't really a problem and you don't need to supplement unless you're deficient. So basically you wait until you're deficient before you start supplementing, even though the foods that you eat do not have B12. So why you would wait and not just supplement in the first place? Obviously, this is really stupid and really dangerous, especially for pregnant women. Having low B12 levels by the second trimester means that Tina pretty much absolutely was deficient in B12 for the entire first trimester. It takes a long time for someone to become deficient in B12. She was probably deficient for a long time which is incredibly alarming because being deficient in B12 around conception may increase the risk for neural tube defects like spina bifida and being deficient during the pregnancy just in general is also linked to premature birth. Luckily, Leo obviously was not born premature and obviously does not have anything like spina bifida just based on the, the pictures and whatnot. But still to introduce that risk in the first place when all she had to do was take a cheap supplement, that is so just that's so terrible. It's so negligent. And it really shows how much this diet, this lifestyle comes first for them, even at the expense of their baby's health. Now I'm assuming that she is still supplementing for B12. I, who knows? Again, you're talking about people who don't brush their teeth. So who, you know, <laughs> who, who really knows, but I'm assuming that she's still supplementing for B12. I am 
really hoping that she went back and got more testing done, uh, preferably a, a urine MMA test rather than a blood test. But even a blood test would be better than nothing. So I really hope she's gone back and got tested to make sure that her levels are sufficient, to make sure that her milk is sufficient. Other nutrients could be a problem as well if her diet is really, really low in them, but more likely her milk will be sufficient and baby Leo will be fine since they just need so few of these nutrients and she'll be the one who suffers basically she'll be the one who suffers deficiency which is better in my opinion I mean right she's the one who's choosing to eat this diet if I have to choose between Tina suffering or Leo suffering obviously I'd rather her suffer this is her choice this baby did not choose this shit the video ends with another thing that you've probably heard raw food is say, particularly people who eat like this fruit-based uh, kind of diet. So people like Fully Raw Christina. I know what some of you might be thinking because we get a lot of these voices that, hey, your, your diet is so restrictive, you know, just eat fruits and nothing else. And I think that's why I want to show you our fruit stash just today. It's just a random fruit stash of the day. Yeah, it's it's a lot of quantity. Like, yeah, no one's going to deny that that's not a huge amount of fruit, but it's, it's still just fruit. Like there's not even vegetables there. <laughs> like it is very clearly an insanely restrictive diet. Any diet is restrictive, right? A vegan diet is restrictive. Obviously you are cutting out certain foods. You are restricting what you are eating. Uh, just normal dieting, just reducing calories is restricting. You are restricting, you know, how much food you are eating. And typically people are restricting the kinds of foods they're eating as well. A lot of people are eating very few or cutting out completely like, you know, processed carbs. The problem isn't restriction per se. Any healthy way of eating is going to be at least somewhat restrictive, right? Um, the problem is restricting your diet so much that it is very, very hard, if not impossible, to meet nutrient needs. Eating a fruit-only diet makes it virtually, if not just totally impossible to get enough protein, to get enough calcium, to get enough iodine, to get enough sodium, to get enough zinc without overeating like a lot on calories, right? Without eating like thousands of calories more than you would need on just a, a regular diet. So yeah, this, I mean, it's disturbing. What the fuck else can I say? You know, it's, it's disturbing that she ate only fruit for her whole pregnancy. It's disturbing that uh, her milk is very likely not sufficient. It's disturbing that they plan on feeding Leo only fruit. It's disturbing that so many people have positive things to say about this whole thing. Uh, as far as Leo, like I said, she has photos of him on her Instagram. I'm not sure if I'm going to show photos or not. I, I think I might be instituting a new policy of not showing anyone's kids. I mean, you guys know how I feel about showing my own kids and these channels that are focused on showing kids. I really don't like it at all. Um, and I, <sighs> he's just a tiny baby. I don't know. I'm probably not going to show the pictures at all, even in my video. Um, but you can obviously go to their Instagram and see them for yourself. So a lot of people have said that he looks skinny and malnourished in, he, in these pictures. And honestly, that was my first impression. There are, there are a few pictures in particular that are hard for me to look at. They're, oh shit. <laughs> I might get emotional on this. This is uh, another reason why I didn't want to do this video. But um, there are a few pictures where he looks, his cheeks have like no fat on them. They are so skinny. I've never seen a baby that looks like that. Even newborn babies, they have a good amount of fat on them unless there is something wrong. Even a lot of premature babies do not look like that. But his most recent photos from just like a day or so ago, um, it does look like, it, it's hard to tell via pictures, you know, but it, it does like, like look like he's gained some more fat since birth, so obviously that's great. But if I were her, I would be worried personally because he really doesn't look that different from a month ago. You know, he's he's about a month old. Um, he really doesn't look that different from like the the newborn photos. And so for me personally, you know, I'd, I'd be a, a little bit concerned about that. Or honestly, I wouldn't be. I mean, it would depend on what my doctor said. It would depend on what my baby's pediatrician thought and how his, you know, growth chart looked. Which kind of brings me to my next point, makes me wonder, 
Did Tina see a doctor at all during her pregnancy? Did she have regular prenatal appointments? Well, uh, no. No, she did not. They travel constantly, like I said, so that would make it pretty much impossible to have any sort of regular appointment, like set up with a doctor, right? Um, and also she said she doesn't have insurance. But honestly, at no point did I feel like I need to have a doctor leading me through this baby carrying experience. I have limited faith in doctors and am generally not good with authoritative figures. I wouldn't want a third party, ultimately a stranger, telling me what's going on in my body. If anyone, I am the expert on that. So that seems pretty selfish. You know, I mean, it's it's not just about you when you're pregnant, obviously. It's it's also about the life that you're kind of responsible for now. But uh, I guess she's the expert. So yeah, no doctor, no ultrasounds. Although according to her, those aren't useful anyway. Ultrasounds only show the number of babies inside, the position of the baby in that moment, and the heart rate of the baby in that very moment and little other reliable info. That's so wrong. So for those who don't know, a typical low risk pregnancy would have like two to three ultrasounds. You'd have one pretty early on to try to figure out uh, when baby was conceived. That's if you aren't you know, sure about the first day of your last missed period. Uh, you'd have another one at around 12 weeks. That's the nuchal translucency test. And then you would have another one, the anatomy scan at about 20 weeks. Some women will need more if you are, you know, considered a high risk pregnancy or if the doctor thinks that, you know, maybe the baby isn't growing properly. So they want to do an ultrasound to check, things like that. Uh, and then there are some women who just get extra ultrasounds done because they really want to see the baby, which is understandable, but you're really not supposed to do that. Anyway, these tests offer far more than just heart rate and position of the baby. The nuchal translucency test can tell you uh, your baby's risk of having certain chromosomal defects or certain heart problems, which, you know, whether you would end the pregnancy or not, if say it turned out your baby was at high risk for having Down syndrome, it's still a really good idea. It's still really important to have that information as soon as possible. If this test tells you that your baby is at high risk and you want to continue the pregnancy, well, now you have months to gain information, to talk to professionals, to figure out what exactly raising, you know, a special needs baby entails. Um, you can figure out what resources are available in your area. The anatomy scan, as I mentioned, at about 20 weeks is incredibly important. This is when they uh, measure the baby. This will usually be like the longest ultrasound, especially if your baby it was really active in the womb, like tiny baby was. It was really funny. The technician, oh my God, it took so long because she would get, okay, like we're gonna measure the femur now and then baby would just move and she'd have to try and find it again. It was pretty funny. So yeah, obviously, you know, knowing that baby is growing properly can be a huge comfort to us. But again, it's also incredibly important because if something looks like it might be wrong, then your doctor can move forward with steps to figure out what's going on and try to rectify the situation. They also look for, you know, the kidneys and the liver. They also check the position of the placenta, which can be very important for a safe vaginal birth. So if you never have an ultrasound, you don't have access to any of this information. You don't have the ability to rectify a situation a dangerous situation if it can be rectified. Like maybe your baby isn't growing properly because of poor nutrition, because you're eating a fucking fruit diet, maybe. You have no ability to plan for the future. Like if, you know, maybe the anatomy scan discovers that there's some sort of heart defect that is going to require surgery soon after birth. Like there is a reason that these ultrasounds are standard care. And Tina is 40 years old, which automatically puts her in high risk category. And it makes tests like the ultrasound, the nuchal translucency tests, and other genetic screening even more important since her age already puts her baby at greater risk for having chromosomal defects. So anyway, on to Leo. You know, does Leo have a doctor? Does he have a pediatrician that he has seen? I mean, at this point, if he's about a month old, you know, you see, obviously you have testing and whatnot done in the hospital, and then you would, he would see a pediatrician about day three or day five. Then there's a two week appointment. Then there's a one month appointment. And that's just standard basic care. You know, if, if there's anything wrong, there would be more appointments. Like, you know, my baby was still losing weight by about like one week, tiny baby. Uh, so we had a couple extra appointments. I don't know. I couldn't find anywhere that she said if he has a doctor or not. I would guess 
that he doesn't. Um, I know they were planning for a home birth, an unassisted home birth, and it seems like that's what happened. Um, and she didn't, you know, announce the weight, which usually when you announce a birth, uh, you typically say the weight. It's just one of those things. If you've ever seen a birth announcement, if you've ever gone on a pregnancy forum with women constantly saying, hey, my baby is born, like, they're going to list the weight. It's just one of those things. So I'm guessing they had an un unassisted home birth where, you know, obviously they wouldn't have a scale or anything. They're very, very minimalist as she talks about a lot. So it's very unlikely that she would have any sort of, of a uh, very accurate scale, like one of those baby scales. We have one of those where they could, you know, even try to weigh him. So yeah, I, I'm guessing he has not seen a doctor, which again means he's never been weighed. He hasn't been measured. Uh, no vitamin K shot, no hep B vaccine, no hearing test, no CCHD screening, which, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising, you know, given her comments on doctors. Uh, you know, again, we're talking about people who don't brush their teeth. <laughs> they think that fruit is an adequate toothbrush. You know, they, they think their, their diet is perfect, that their lifestyle is perfect. Uh, if they don't need doctors, why would their baby? But of course, their diet is nowhere close to perfect. And even if it were, prenatal care is still so important, especially for someone who is over 35, especially for someone who struggled with weight loss. In the first five months of pregnancy, before the fatty jungle fruits of Borneo, I kept on losing weight instead of gaining it. So losing weight during the first trimester is incredibly common and typically is not a cause for concern. You know, we're typically dealing with nausea and food aversion and all that kind of stuff, and it's just really hard to eat enough calories. I know during my first pregnancy with toddler, I lost about six pounds by the second trimester. But losing weight well into the second trimester is not common, especially for someone who clearly is not overweight at all, someone like Tina. And her weight loss, you know, it might have been fine. It might not have been. This is what doctors are for. You know, not receiving medical care when you are pregnant, when you are already very thin, starting the pregnancy very thin, and then you are losing weight that far into the pregnancy. What can you say? You know, I keep saying it's negligent, it's irresponsible, it is. And I think on some level, Tina knew this. It seems like she was very worried at some point about the weight loss, which good, she should have been. She says on Instagram that she decided to Google optimum pregnancy diet. Um, and obviously she wasn't going to follow the advice, but she did start tracking her nutrients, but then came to the conclusion that A, the fresh, sun-ripened, premium quality fruits we are eating are probably nowhere near the figures they used for online calculations. The absorption rate in the gut of a long-term fruitarian is incomparable to that of someone on a regular diet. And C, the data on how much of each nutrient a pregnant woman needs may or may not be reliable, so any tracking and calculations don't actually actually makes sense. As always, we decided to follow our gut, literally, and concluded that what makes me feel absolute best, fruit, is best for the baby too. In other words, the tracking showed her something she didn't want to see. It showed her everything that was missing in her diet. It shone a light on just how shitty eating only fruit is. And instead of acknowledging that, instead of facing that and saying, okay, well, I need to make some changes. I need to improve this diet so that I can provide everything that my baby needs, everything that I need, right? Instead of doing that, she just said, no, no, it's, it's wrong. This information is wrong. <laughs> like actually the fruit that we consume is far more nutritious than the fruit that's in the database. No evidence for that. Uh, long-term fruitarians actually have superior absorption no evidence for that. And actually tracking is, is not useful anyway. Again, it's very clear that the lifestyle, that the fruit hunting, that the traveling, all of that, that all of that comes before the baby and comes before her own health too. This is how delusional they are. It's what do you, what do you do? It's so fucking upsetting. The final thing I'll say what happens if she stops producing? What happens if she becomes so malnourished that she can't produce milk anymore or can't produce enough milk to sustain Leo? What will she do? I mean, obviously any normal person would go to formula. That's the only other answer, right? That's the only appropriate answer. If you can't produce milk, you use formula. But do we really think she would do that? Would she try to do some sort of fruit blend drink or something for him to eat? I don't know. I mean, it's not unheard of. We've seen this happen before where these crazy parents 
who are totally delusional, like Tina and Simon, and they can't breastfeed or whatever, end up making like these quinoa milks or, or soy milk, orange juice, whatever. And the consequences are exactly what you would expect them to be. So it's all super, super depressing. And I don't, the worst part is I don't think anything can be done about it. Even if child services or whatever the equivalent in Bali, I think right now they're in Bali, uh, Udun, Ubud, Ubud, I forgot what the town in Bali in Indonesia is called, but I think that's where they are right now. And again, they travel all the time anyway. So, you know, if, if, anything were to happen, they could just leave with the baby, which is, I think, actually what another family, um, I think they were fruitarians, actually, and that that's what they did. You know, the police were concerned, and they kept trying to, I'm not sure if they were trying to actually, you know, take the baby and, and put the baby into foster care, but every time that the police would become concerned, the family would just leave and they'd move somewhere else. So, uh, obviously, this is something that they could do, but anyway, even if child services or whatever the equivalent is in Bali, uh, were to go to their house, I-, I doubt anything would be done because again, Leo doesn't look malnourished. Like I seriously doubt they would take the baby and try to find a proper home for him. He's a bit skinny, but I don't think that would be enough to remove him from the home. But I mean, to, to end a little bit positively, they can still make changes. Like this is not just over and done and he's destined to be potentially very, very sick. Like they can make changes. The fact that he looks as good as he does at least shows that she at some point started eating a lot of calories. And like she said, she started eating more fatty fruits. I I think she started eating more olives. So at least she was getting a lot of fat in her diet um, and probably a lot of calories. So it's not as bad as it could have been. And it seems like this could be turned around pretty easily just by improving their diet a little bit, you know, at least by taking like a a multivitamin every single day, including some vegetables, you know, you don't even have to go the cooked food, food route. I mean, obviously that would be preferable, but even just including some vegetables would be such a huge step up because you're starting from, you're starting from such a bad diet, including some vegetables, including some nuts and seeds. Again, you can still be raw if you really want to. It would be such a huge improvement. And I mean, look, she did start taking B12. Like that's a really, that's a really good sign. (laughs) You know, there, there are people who even in the face of deficiency, even having data saying, Hey, you are very sick. They would not do anything about it. And the fact that she was like, Oh shit. And she started supplementing for B12. That's a really good sign. It's not too late. You know, it's not too late. They can still make changes. And so, you know, I'm going to end with a, a positive story that is very, very related to this. So this was years ago, probably seven, eight years ago. Uh, when I was still kind of in the raw food world. For those who don't know, I ate a fruit diet, fruit-based diet, not all fruit, but mostly fruit for many years. Um, And I had a friend who was also kind of in that community. And she was very concerned about this friend of hers, this mother who was raw fruitarian and had stayed raw fruitarian during her pregnancy. My friend had not. She had ended up eating cooked foods because she just was craving them and she couldn't keep eating fruits and vegetables. And so thankfully she started eating cooked foods. Anyway, um, she was very concerned about this mother and her baby. And she sent me video of the baby. I'm going to try not to cry. The baby, I think, uh, I think the baby was about six weeks old and it was worse because my friend's baby was also six weeks old and her baby looked totally normal and happy and chubby and, you know, moving around, very alert. And this baby was not, they were so incredibly skinny. I've never seen anything like that in like a, in a developed country. They were in Hawaii. Um, I've, I've never seen anything like that. They were so incredibly skinny and so just, just not active, just so listless. It was like they couldn't even keep their eyes open. So happy ending. Thank God. Um, the mother and the father woke up basically. And I think it was because they ended up, ended up leaving Hawaii and going back to the mother's family. And I assume the mother's family was like, hell no, this is not okay. Because part of the problem, just like with Fit Shorty Eats, is they had a whole community that was telling them that their baby was healthy and that their baby looked great. They were surrounded by all these crazy 
fruit fucks who were telling them that this was all totally kosher. And so, of course, then they go back to Normalville and they go back to normal people who are like, no, this is not okay. Your baby is suffering. We need to fix this. And so that woke them up. And apparently then the mother and the baby were thriving because she started eating properly and obviously, I guess, producing enough milk for the baby. That was clearly the problem in this case that she just was not producing anywhere close to enough milk. And she was also in the video and was so skinny. I mean, she looked absolutely horrible as well. Point is to, to have, you know, a situation that was that bad. You know, I mean, th this baby was so obviously in serious trouble, whereas Leo, again, looks a little bit skinny, but nothing even close to this. And they were able to get out of that and make changes and make serious improvements. They can change this. <laughs> like th This can be changed. They can fix this. And they can fix this even without, I mean, if they're, they're so tied to the fruit hunting thing, like they can still do that kind of stuff. Like they can make changes without totally changing their lifestyle. I mean, obviously they would have to settle down somewhere so that they can have regular doctor's appointments. But, you know, I, it's, ugh, God. Anyway, I wanted to leave you with at least something kind of positive. You can try reporting the video if you want. I don't think anything will happen. Um, I think YouTube will just go, what, this is just a pregnant lady talking about pregnancy stuff. Who cares? You know, they're, they're not going to take the video down for like child abuse. I think they should. If it were my fucking platform, this shit would be gone. Um, but you know, it's YouTube. So free speech, but you can try. And you know, if, if you want to go to Instagram, and leave some comments. I think that's a good idea. If not for them, um, at least for other people who may be reading it, you know, don't be hateful, obviously. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone coming for me is. I hope not. But, you know, just a little like, hey, this is like, this maybe isn't a good idea. You might want to see a dietitian. you know, whatever. I, I don't know how useful it's going to be, but it's pretty easy. And, you know, it, it might be, it might be a good thing to do. So anyway, thanks. And I'll have a new video soon.